Hello, Radiant Church. Pastor Jeremy here, and uh, this is part two of our devotional series looking at the life of Paul. And we find ourselves in Acts chapter 9. And uh, I'm going to give you a little context and then read a couple portions from it. We don't have time to read the entire chapter. But what's happening here is that Paul is hot on the trail of Christians. He's gotten uh, legal authority to go and uh, literally want to, he's going to be dragging people out of their homes to uh, persecute them. He's going to he's persecuting the church of Christ. And on the way, while doing that, he experiencing, experiences something quite profound. It says, and he said, oh, I'm sorry. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So he goes and hangs out sightless there for a bit. And then Ananias is uh, visited by the Lord, or is spoken to by the Lord, and says, go to Saul, uh, who he knew he was, was persecuting the church, and go and baptize him and pray for him. And Ananias doesn't want to have anything to do with it because he's nervous about what Saul might do to him, what Paul might do to him. But he ends up going, and this is what he experiences when he goes. The Lord speaks to him and says, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Now, this is an amazing story. I mean, talk about a turnaround. Paul experiences uh, an amazing change of direction. He goes from persecuting the church to planting churches eventually. And as radical as a transformation that is for Paul, it's no different for you and I. Everyone who is called by the Lord, who is saved by the grace of Christ, experiences such a tr radical transformation, a completely different trajectory of life. Uh, it happened, it, we experience that in the gospel, specifically in the way that we deal with suffering. Look at verse 16 again. What in the world is going on here? Talk about an interesting way to be called into the kingdom. God says this to Saul again, for I will show you how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God's saying, he, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for the sake of my name. What is that all about? What is he talking about? Well, what that is about is this. A call to Christ is a call to obedience. When we become a disciple of Jesus, we are converted, we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then we spend the rest of our lives learning how to obey, according to Matthew 28, what Jesus taught us to do. We learn, it's a life of learning to walk in obedience, and obedience always involves suffering to some degree, just the way it goes. Uh, he, a good way of understanding this is uh, found in Hebrews 5.8, another curious passage where it says of Jesus, that he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, Jesus was perfect. What does it mean that he learned obedience through what he suffered? John Piper says it this way. He says, Jesus did not learn how to obey through suffering. Instead, what he says is that Jesus learned what obedience looked like in the midst of suffering. That is to say that obedience involves Suffering. This is certainly what Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he said, he, he's, he's, he's breaking before the Lord, breaking before the Father. And he's saying, if it's possible, let this cup pass before me. He's, he's, couldn't, he's feeling the weight of what he's about ready to experience on the cross. And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He learned obedience through what he suffered. 
And the reason, if that was true for Jesus, it's all the who was perfect, it's all the more uh, for you and I who have sin to deal with and grapple with in our lives. What happens, the reason why obedience always involves suffering to some degree is that the will of God often cuts against the grain of our will. Um, Jesus, or God uh, says uh, of, of himself that his ways are not our ways, man's ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We often get that mixed up. We assume God agrees with us more often, more than we ought to. We ought to. He's, his, way is, his way of thinking, his value system is different. His way of thinking is different. His way of handling problems is different. His way of facing evil, of facing trials, all of it's different. His ways are not our ways. And so often is the case as Christians, we're seeking to live a life that is uh, righteous, and we end up exalting, especially in our culture, because it exalts comfort to such a high degree, but we exalt our comfort to such a degree that our obedience um, ends up becoming me doing what I want and assuming that God agrees with me. I just end up doing what I want, and I assume God is agreeing, agreeing with me and for what I'm doing. And when we're in that mindset, we end up getting in the habit of ignoring little character flaws. Little character flaws that over time can become quite hellish. It's so sad when this happens because we end up saying, well, I can ignore this little, this flaw because look at all the other good that I'm doing here. And what I've found in my years of ministry and uh, just living, uh, living for Christ is that sin is not, we may be done with sin, but it's not done with us. Sin is a power that's, it doesn't sit idle. It always seeks to come and consume and destroy us. And we end up in the name of comfort, seeking to avoid suffering by not embracing uh, the call of God in such, to such degree or following the leading of the Holy Spirit to face those difficult things and allow God to develop character the character of Christ in us as we face these hard things. And the reality is only grace is sufficient to move us in this direction. It does this in two different ways. One is that in grace, I, because of what Christ has done for me, the fact that he thirsted so that I could have my thirst quenched. He was forsaken so that I'm by the Father that I might be drawn into relationship with the Father. When I realized that Jesus did that for me, out of sheer grace, I am moved to want to give my life for him, to surrender my life to him, to surrender everything to him. And also, I am able in grace, because of the righteousness that I uh, of Christ that now envelops me, I can actually be honest about my sin and actually look at it. I don't have to ignore it and counterweight my uh, my, my good works with my bad works and say, this is okay. I can be honest and say, I need to deal with this because if I don't, if I don't, if I don't, because it's hard, it, it involves suffering to do that. It, it's, we suffer when we look at our sin. It's no fun to look at our sin and to admit that we're wrong and to admit that we need help. But what we learn in relationship with Christ, that his grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in our weakness as we surrender to him. And so that's what I think it means with when we learn obedience through what we suffer, when we, what Paul learned, what he must suffer for the name of Christ is this, is that because he did what I just described, he was able to face all kinds of intense things and keep on going and keep on displaying the character and the essence of Christ in all that he did. Let's do the same. Amen. Blessings on you.